Welcome to the guest speaker series for Glasgow Caledonian New York College's Center for Social Impact and Innovation. I am thrilled to host today Dr. Joanne Roll and Dr. Mariano Bernardes. Dr. Roll holds a PhD in economics from Howard University, and she has served as the Dean of the School of Business at Medgar Evers College, City University of New York for the past eight years. Dean Roll is an accomplished leader with a consistent history of success who served in the US government and IBM before her academic career. During her academic career, she launched two entrepreneurial centers and many entrepreneurship programs. Dr. Roll, Dr. Roll's awards include two citations from former Brooklyn, New York Borough President Eric Adams for leadership and community service. She has been recognized as a top 25 influential African-American woman in business. And Dr. Roll is also a member of the GCNYC Board of Trustees. Dr. Mariano Bernardes is CEO of the Kaufman Center at the Performance Improvement Institute of Chicago. He is the current advisor for several Fortune 500 companies and governments. Dr. Bernardes is a published author of six books and multiple articles on business and societal performance. As CEO of the Kaufman Center, Dr. Bernardes is the executive manager for the Kaufman Awards in Societal and Social Impact and the CK Prahalet Awards in Social Innovation. Dr. Bernardes has worked for more than 25 years in urban and regional transformation and turning around cities and communities in Argentina, Mexico, Panama, Europe, and the United States. He has three forthcoming books on societal performance based on the Kaufman and Prahalad Awards cases. And he holds a PhD from the University of Buenos Aires. This presentation comes from the work that Drs. Roll and Bernardes recently collaborated on. Dr. Roll co-edited a handbook on the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. It is a collection of essays that brings together unique experiences and multiple perspectives by scholars and researchers across the globe, spanning Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the United States. And Dr. Bernardes has the first chapter in this book and he will speak about that. It is a fascinating volume that documents not only theories for social impact, but also speaks about on the ground, meaningful impact. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Roll who will start the presentation. I am Joanne Roll, Dean of the School of Business, Mega Evers College. I do apologize for not, uh, not unmuting. Uh, I promise to try and keep the presentation uh, to uh, my time limit. And for that, I always uh, have myself on a timer. Okay, so I'm a co-editor with uh, two other young scholars, uh, Dr. Kisato and Dr. Kibaya, both uh, out of Kenya. Uh, one is at Kenyatta University and the other is at Makeka University. I want to bring to talk first about the challenge of worldwide income inequity, our work that we have done globally with, with several scholars, an introduction and a purpose of the handbook that, uh, that Jackie so graciously showed you in the beginning in her remarks, research questions, our methodology, uh, several of the book sections, but want to focus on the first section, which is where Mariano's work, uh, outstanding work in the field of uh, in inequity and uh, bottom-up solutions for urban communities. And I call that personally, when I talk about the book, the hope for the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. So often we hear about the problems, but very rarely do we see outcomes that are measured, that are positive uh, and, and in the way that Mariano 
Mario and his Mariano and his colleagues have done, uh, including Roger Kaufman, who is a personal mentor of mine, and many, many, including Mariano. Uh, practical implications and conclusions and our charge. Oftentimes we come to webinars, conferences, and we, we listen, we get inspired, we feel good, but then the takeaway is not much. There is the book, but here is the question. This is the why. You know, oftentimes we'll hear folks say, well, you should be able to uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, and what they don't forget is some, some of us weren't wearing shoes much less bootstraps. So you see in this little parody for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree where all of them don't have the same resources, capabilities or ability to climb the tree, but often that is forgotten. And it's because those who are wearing those lens like that particular instructor can't see the difference in the abilities. So our challenge is worldwide income inequity. And this is my quote, the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved is a struggle for humanity. It is not a one institution problem. It is not a one country problem. It is a global issue. What this map is showing, and for the first time around 2018, data became available that was normalized that we could see from country to country the, uh, the issue of income and in, 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 in equity. The darker the map, the more inequitable it is. You can see 10% uh, of the national income is earned in the darkest by 50 to 70% of, uh, of the income. 10% of the population is earning that much of the income. And one might think developed countries are better, but uh, the US and the USSR are about the same, right around 40 to 50%, uh, uh, unlike some of the other developing countries. So I show you this to show, say this was a pre-pandemic problem and the pandemic has widened the gap uh, and, 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 and so I want to talk a little bit about our work. As leaders we need to allow ourselves to experiment to try things out and make adjustments. The old normal was not good for the majority of the world's population. So when people say, well, we want to get back to normal, that normal wasn't good for most of us. Leaders navigating the future of work will find themselves experiencing the uncomfortable changes of the creative process. They must also be surprised by what they discover. And that's by Jeff Schwartz, who's the lead uh, scholar from the uh, Deloitte practice. And, and that was in his book, Work Disrupted, which it came out early uh, uh, last year. So uh, in the work that we have done, uh, I just have to say that we, there were scholars from Kenya, scholars from Jamaica, scholars from Chile, and, uh, and the U.S., uh, I will say Brooklyn proper, we all came together at two different conferences, one in, uh, uh, earlier 2016, and we kept working together because the problems that we were looking to solve for our students and uh, impact of our students weren't solved. And so we wanted to take the scope of work beyond just the five or six scholars who had been working together and to broaden it. And that was the genesis of this book. The purpose of the handbook is to present a global snapshot regarding the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved and various perspectives from different authors on what these new changes predict for the underserved in the world. When we were doing our homework, we saw a lot of discourse on the future of work and what it was gonna do, but we didn't see it coming from the voices of those who really understood the pain and the tragedy of what happens to the underserved. So what were the key research questions? Uh, we were looking for key themes on the discourse. We were looking for how technology, and technology is a driver of much of the transformation we see, technology and innovation transforming the future of work and entrepreneurship for underserved communities globally. Uh, and we wanted to also not just look at the problem, but come up with recommendations. And that's why I so love Roger and Mariana's work, because they don't just focus on the problem. They focus on the solution and different ways of coming up with the solution 
other than uh, some ways that we traditionally have done in other areas. So we did our literature review. We did a call for abstract. It was made to a global audience. And it, this was done by our first publisher, uh, the Center for Business and Economic Research. They had thousands on, on the, uh, their list and they distributed the call for chapters. Abstracts were peer reviewed and analyzed to identify commonalities and key areas of focus among the underserved worldwide. And so the very first chapter is what is driving all of this change. And it's the technology and innovation. And the very first chapter, because of the power and the empowerment, uh, was uh, uh, Mariano's uh, work on social innovation strategies to transform slums into successful neighborhoods in Latin America. And I was um, enamored by the work because he talks about not running away from the slums, not running away from those in crime not running away from the dark parts of our community, but embracing them and using that for positive change. So he will talk about that. I don't want to talk much more about it. I'm so glad he's been able to be with us because he wasn't feeling well. And I was telling my colleagues that, you know, he might not be able to come. And when he showed up, I was almost shouting. Okay, so technology as it disrupts creative industries and entrepreneurial ventures, that's another one. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but the last one is artificial intelligence intelligence, automation, and the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. It was a review of the literature on gains, losses, and opportunities. The second area that we focused on was diversity and inclusive labor markets. We know in many of the markets that have labor dis, uh, 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 labor malfunctions, that it, the issue of, of inclusivity is a problem. And so workforce diversity, creating profits and, profits and employment, uh, uh, pandemic and the performance of women-owned uh, micro enterprises in Kenya and female in, immigrants as entrepreneurs. The next area of the book focuses on small business development. And as you can see, the different titles, we focused on different case areas, specific case areas uh, in India and Africa and other areas. I'm moving quickly through this because I, I, I really want to get to uh, what some of our findings were. In the last section of the book, we do talk about the power of education and training. And we talk about it through the lens of those who are impacted. Access and impact com uh, combining community first and digital methods for entrepreneurial education. Uh, agency training and determinants of success among beauty entrepreneurs. And this was one of my favorite ones. It talked about the beauty industry in India and the women who had a challenge getting employment in the normal markets because in those places, men first get the jobs. And so what they wanted to do was to become economically empowered themselves to help their families. Uh, in some of the communities, the uh, income that the husband was making was not enough for the community. And I will say that they highlighted here, it's still a cultural issue for a woman to take a job even by the husband. But what they found was when they were able to make these beauty entrepreneurs actually have, uh, uh, be able to, uh, the household provide additional income, it changed some of the expectations and the appreciation towards women uh, working and women being entrepreneurs. And it cited in one sample that the husband was actually appreciative that his wife for the first time was able to contribute and help him help the family so that they could get more education and training for their, for the, for their children. So this was a positive uh, example of bottom up how entrepreneurship can change lives. And so the next one was creating the next generation of entrepreneurs for entrepreneurial growth in an emerging market. This one was talking about in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, they have a situation where many of the, uh, of the entrepreneurs of origin from the country were being displaced by Chinese goods and services flooding the market. And what it was talking about was the need to also keep uh, domestic businesses uh, thriving, uh, not in competition with uh, the other markets that was coming in, but 
in awareness that it is important to keep the uh, entrepreneurs in business uh, to facilitate not just this generation of biz uh, businesses, but the next generation of businesses that are coming. So I call this hope for the future. And Mariana was, will explain to you in detail the ecosystem that they put in place in several countries that defied the note notation that uh, people, poor people uh, don't know how to or don't want to help themselves. And I won't tell this story, but this story moved me because what they did was they said, it is not, if you just come to the problem with one lens saying, be secu saying security in the slums, people don't wanna come to slums for security and you fix that problem. There will be another problem created. So you have to come to the problem whole holistically looking at all the issues, sharing the vision, empowering the community, and therefore uh, making change happen. It just doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen with one stakeholder. Many stakeholders have to be involved. And so you understand why we love the work and we, we let, had it to lead the volume of the book um, uh, because we believe that this is a... Uh, a, a hope-driven solution. So practical implications and conclusions. We proposed that unity and community and capacity building is vital to create a shared prosperity. A lot of times governments do top-down uh, policies, public policies. And then they look back and they wonder, well, why didn't that work? Well, if you want a public policy to work, you need to ask the people who you're doing the policy for uh, and to have them share in the solution so the solution will be sustainable. And I haven't mentioned that word yet, but it's sustainability is what we are looking at. Uh, in this handbook, we have shared a summary of the chapters which incl are included in the book and perspectives of what the future of work and entrepreneurship will evolve into, into what we're calling a new normal, a normal that we haven't, normal is almost oxymoron, a normal that we haven't seen before, but a normal that we would like to transcend and transform into where we take more people along than that top 10% that I showed you in the beginning, who, uh, and not only that, did they thrive before the pandemic, they are thriving even more uh, now after the pandemic because of the situation, the economic uh, situation, health and economic situation that was created by that crisis. We hope that this analysis will create further dialogue in the academy, industry, and policy on how to ensure the underserved are included in the future of work and entrepreneurship for a better normal. And, you know, the charge, as I started off in the beginning, the charge is not just to sit back and let everybody else do the work. The charge is for all of us to find a piece of the work that we can do. Indeed, our communities can serve as laboratories for innovation where we can deliver and test reskilling programs, explore the creation of transition nets, and reset local agendas as precursor to resetting national policies and programs that in the past just have not worked for the majority of us. I can say as a way to ending, this, this book did get the attraction and the attention of, uh, of another publisher, IGI Publishers, and they asked us to uh, work with them in publishing the sustainability of the future of work and entrepreneurs for the underserved. We did a call for pay, a, a call for chapters. Over sixty uh, uh, abstracts came in. Uh, almost fifty full chapters came in, and we could only have, or we contracted only for fifteen chapters. Letting you know there is a global cry and a need to hear voices of not just the cat academics, but practitioners who want to have not just problems, but solutions with their voices, their insights, and their knowledge. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Mariana, who, who will share with you what I, what I continue to think is outstanding work. And uh, I am hoping that more and more of the work is shared. Thank you. The floor is...
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marina Bernardes, uh, and I'm going to present what we basically developed for the first chapter of this book that was so graciously introduced already by Dr. Roll. I hope this. Our, our topic is social innovation strategies to uh, address and transform the problem of slums, turning slums into successful neighborhoods in Latin America. Uh, if we look at the problem, uh, Latin America has one of the largest, as Dr. Roll showed, uh, levels of inequality in income. Uh, for example, several countries, including Nicaragua, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, and Bolivia have over almost 50% of their population living in slums and sanitary crowded uh, abatements. And in, even in countries with middle income like Argentina, Chile, or Mexico, we are talking about 15% of the population. That's a real challenge that we are facing. We, we thought about how to address the challenge. And the first thing we look for was we need to have a shared vision. If we don't agree where we go, what we have are partial solutions and most uh, dangerously, lack of support or lack of commitment of all the stakeholders. So what, what was this uh, vision? Roger Kaufman, my mentor and friend, and also Dr. Rawls, defined it as a mega vision. And the idea is a minimal idea vision about the future we all want for our children. So what is the guiding star for the effort of transforming a slum into a neighborhood. Well, neighbor, let's start by saying that slums are uh, the beginning of cities. Every city was once a slum. Whomever have read, uh, have read Dickens or Huckleberry Finn can recall that once uh, the United States and in England were populated by people living in, in shacks in unsanitary conditions. However, some countries evolved into housing and others remain in slums. And the key thing is looking at what is what everybody wants for their children. Here is no person will be under the care, control or custody of another person, agency or, or a, substance. There will be no losses of life, no elimination or reduction of levels of well-being, survival, self-sufficiency, or quality of life. So a minimal ideal vision requires a, a guiding star, a top. We want a, a community without war, riot, terrorists, or unlawful civil unrest, without unintended human causes changing to the environment, without murder, rape, or crimes of violence, without substance abuse, with shelter, with permanent uh, without permanent or continuing disabilities, without disease, starvation, or malnutrition, destructive behavior, including child, partner, spouse, elder, abuse, accidents, including transportation, discrimination based in irrelevant variables, uh, like including color, race, creed, etc., sexual orientation, etc. Some people would say, oh, this is ideal, it's never to be achieved. Well, the point is, you have to look towards the ideal level that everybody agrees is what they want for their children, for the future, and look at the current level to identify gaps. Gaps are difference in results, not difference in resources. And based on that, we need a, a systemic framework. As Dr. Roll mentioned, is very frequently uh, the, the slum problem is addressed with the housing approach. Oh, we have to build public housing. And uh, well, all of a sudden, you have a Cabrini Green in Chicago. You have public housing transformed in a vertical, in, from vertical to horizontal slum. So you have, uh, in different levels, the same problem because you didn't address the problem of security. And then you address the problem of security and move the problem of security to another neighborhood. Or you look at all these things without employment and you think, OK, these are beautiful apartments. Who's going to give them up? The idea of the systemic framework is looking at the community and the neighborhood with the eyes of a primary care doctor, a family doctor that looks at the entire group living there and starts from this center, uh, this is the neighborhood, towards all the components that are required and try to integrate them. So we have to have a shared vision. We have to have a 
public-private consortiums, we have to have a business case, including not just the economic uh, return on investment, but the social. What are the things that are going to make measurable social impact? And coordination between all the factors, community development, housing, and rehousing. Not, not, not forget that uh, transforming a slum requires transitory rehousing of people while we rebuild the area that was formerly a slum. Security, tourist destination, waste management, health and quality of life, education, training, and overall employment, self-sustainable employment. So let's see some of the cases. All this comes from practice. During 35 years, we have been working in different countries. This is the case one, Refinor, Northwest Argentina. This is an oil company, a refinery, located at the north of this graphic. You see Campo Duran. This is the, the border between Argentina and Bolivia. And from there, a polyduct connecting several cities that live from the activity of the uh, oil company. Over time, the problem we discovered is that all these communities, the company was prospering because the, the basic product was, was, uh, was uh, attractive and rent, uh, generated profits, but the communities were going down and the employees didn't want to stay. Reason, well, we started talking with them and said, well, you know, they pay me a great salary. I have a great career here, but my children have to go to a school with children who, have, who are using drugs, or there is child prostitution, or we have violence in the streets. So we decided that in order to be successful, we have to turn inside out the training program we developed for the company. And we started working in the community, developing entrepreneurship. They were living in, uh, from the oil industry that was going down and uh, ignoring most of them had uh, properties, basically agriculture properties. They have no idea about agriculture, but send their children to agricultural schools. We put that back in place and we try to develop 120 agricultural uh, for uh, small uh, enterprises. At this time, 1998, they started with a, a new kind of crop, soy, that became uh, obviously popular. You can see here the results uh, over time. We started with conventional planning and the violence and social indicators were going up. When we started investing in developing the community, all the social negative indicators went down and curiously the macro level, so the benefit for the organization went up because people started buying refin or ga gasoline instead of other brands because of what they were doing. When, when the company was sold, we have the opportunity over nine years to observe how all the indicators reverse. So once the co new company decided to discontinue the social investment, all the social unrest went up and the market share went down. So we concluded that there is a way to, to be sustainably profitable on time and it's by investing in social development of the communities where you operate. Second case, south of Sonora region, the famous border between Arizona and Mexico that is usually depicted as a political barrier. Well, we started working uh, in order to help Mexicans to stay in Mexico by developing companies and jobs. And we created a program in a university uh, with the title, Get Your Company a PhD. The requisite for this PhD program was you have to bring in a project and we are going to graduate a company, not just the people who develop the company. And the doctoral candidates will be the entrepreneurs. So over time, we created 15,000 jobs. We created approximately uh, 1,600 companies in all the region that goes from the Southern Sonora border to the border with the United States. Our curriculum was the map. You can see in the map there were agribusiness, aerospatial industry, tourism, and uh, housing. All these were activities for small startups that the company, the, the university was helping develop with private sponsors. The sponsors came to the university and paid to 
for the university to help them incubate and develop their businesses. Third case, Colón, Panama. Here we had a city at the Atlantic extreme entrance of the Panama Canal. It used to be a very wealthy city, a, a nice posh uh, beach town, but it fell in disrepair and it was basically the center of the city was occupied by gangs. There were approximately 25 gangs uh, and, and uh, drug trafficking as main activities. So tourists coming to the, to the port, to the tourist port, were ferry to Panama City on the Pacific without staying in, in Colón. By the time we arrived, they were going to do the extension of the canal, and then they decided, OK, we need to do something about it. And we said, OK, let's look at it. What we did is we started with a demo block at the center, and we said, OK, security, we have gangs. I personally went to talk with the gang leaders and went into the place where they live with their families, because those are the safest places. Says, and I spoke with the women, and they said, you know what? We want jobs for our uh, husbands. They make much more money uh, drug trafficking, but we want them to live longer than 24 years. So we started uh, working with them uh, five years after this process of developing of employment and employability. Many of these, uh, they work in reconstructing the historical uh, district of Colón to make it a tourist attraction. And many of these uh, gang members who were very proficient in English because they used to mug uh, tourists became tourist guides. Others, other of them used their abilities becoming builders and developing small companies to take care of waste management. So all of this, all of this created a total of 15,000 jobs while they were building their own homes. Case number four. Barrio 31, Argentina. This was the oldest slum in Buenos Aires, right next to the highest uh, priced uh, real estate. There was this historical, uh, there was called Villa Esperanza, uh, Hope Villa. The only thing missing there was hope. But we decided to address the problem, again, looking at the total. And we said, okay, what we need to do is this cannot be solved by sending money from government nor be solved by relocating people outside the city. It has to be solved by redefining the, the neighborhood. Most of the people in the neighborhood came from neighboring countries. They were Bolivian, Peruvians. We decided to create a, a Latin American neighborhood in Buenos Aires, like Little Italy, while we will have Little Peru, Little Bolivia, and so on. And most of them were entrepreneurial. So we tried to integrate them to create security and to help them to be business with the city because this was uh, over time become a, a ghetto. Nobody wanted to get there. So we put the management instead of a center of the city, we send the managers to live in the uh, neighborhood and realize what things should be changed by putting what Jane Jacobs uh, defined as eyes on the ground, or I would say feet on the ground as well. I walked there all the time, we had all the meetings there, and we started developing housing and social capital. One of the things we did to break this uh, isolation was put the neighborhood in Google Maps and create application called Neighbors, where neighbors from neighboring neighborhoods uh, were able to ask for, for example, plumbers or electricians or uh, buy food uh, from the neighborhood and get the deliver uh, through a online company, small startups, creating a flow of revenue to fight and to out, outplace the uh, crime and drug dealing that is typical there. Again, there was there another big success in terms of the uh, development. We have also to develop a program through WhatsApp groups not just to train people, but the main problem is not training, giving people new skills, but keeping people, keeping young people to in their jobs because they don't have the employable abilities. The, the conditions in their home sometimes are not good for them to go every day, show up on time, etc. So this program created uh, WhatsApp links with a coach that was calling every day to the new uh, trainees 
to make sure that they were having a good experience and were able to keep their jobs. And that was another of the six secrets of success. So these are five experiences, but we are also creating the CK Prahalat at the Kaufman Center that I direct. CK Prahalat Award for Social Innovation, looking for these kind of examples every year. This year we awarded four uh, awardees in different parts of the world. And of course, I invite everybody else with a practical experience to present. When someone asks me, what is social innovation? I said, you will know it when you see it. So let's look at these cases and go ahead. The purpose of the chapter is precisely that. So thank you very much. I'm open to questions or whatever else you want to say about that. Thank you very much, doctors. Bernardo and, and Dr. Roll, uh, if, if uh, maybe we can all be on the screen together now, if you just want to stop sharing, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so you both mentioned that this morning was the award ceremony for the uh, Prahalad Awards. And I wonder if you could speak more about that and uh, give us a little bit more information about who, who received the awards and a little bit about the history of it. We would love to hear that. Well, we started looking for a social innovation examples, and we formed a, a group of jurors from all over the world. Dr. Roll is one of them. And uh, these jurors help us to find examples in each one of the five continents. So we got candidates from uh, India, Africa, uh, United States, and South America, for example. And those were things that help us to uh, identify different uh, elements. Social innovation is a mix of social impact with the use of a new way to address the problem. For example, the neighbor app is, is a good example. You use uh, an app to help people lose the fear to walk into a slum by knowing, okay, that street has a name, I can see who's there, and the city is giving some guarantee. And then you start breaking barriers of isolation, etc. So each one of the social innovation uh, awards have been dedicated to different people, to different kind of organizations. And the idea is to look. This was my time for the presentation. Uh, to look into real cases and learn from them, because again, instead of starting from a theoretical definition of social innovation, we started from okay. Let's look at what is innovative in terms of social impact. And maybe it's not so much new technology as a new way to use existing technology. WhatsApp, for example, we have in among the poor people, we found women that have 64, 264 members in their WhatsApp group to sell cakes all over the city of Buenos Aires. Well, they were using WhatsApp as a way, as, as an e-commerce platform without any knowledge about e-commerce or platform, but they knew how to use WhatsApp. So we took that and said, okay, maybe that's something we, we should think about. And that's the idea of the Plajarada Award. So this year is open for everybody who, who wants to present a candidate. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, you know, when I was uh, reading your, your chapter, uh, Dr. Bernardes, and I was really taken with the use of what is called city doctors, this systemic model for community mm -hmm. transformation. And instead of improving performance of different subsystems, such as housing, transportation, security, right? Taking that mega approach that you, that you mentioned, which integrates multiple and mutually dependent stakeholders to improve a social ecosystem. Thinking about multiple stakeholders on a global scale. I was thinking about uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's recent call to action initiative, right? That calls on American businesses and social entrepreneurs to invest in Central America as a way to address the root causes of migration. So this sounds very different, right? From what you are describing, but it's uh, meant to have right, positive social impact. I wonder if you could speak 
a little bit about that and, and what you think about that, that call to action. Well, actually, it's, it's in the same uh, venue. For example, the program in Mexico, we started with the, te the topic of immigration. Migration to our United States is for one reason, which is jobs. So the idea is to keep Mexicans in Mexico, you have to develop jobs in Mexico. So what we started doing was looking at the communities and making a better business friendly environment for people to get good jobs in the, in the region. At the same time, we, we study the other thing is 25% of Mexico's investment comes and budget comes from remittances from US. So what we did is, okay, we want to get jobs in Mexico. Construction jobs are very easy to get if you have funding. Now what happened? The remittances are sent to improve existing homes, but they were not directed towards potential projects. We created a public private uh, consortium to bring remittances to build public housing and ho affordable homes. And we created three or four companies with a, a mixed uh, property scheme. So all that money that people sacrifice going to the United States to send back, calculate that approximately 50% of the money workers make in the US, Mexican workers make in the US, they send back to Mexico for their families. The problem is in Mexico, it goes to the government, the government is corrupt and the money never, re never reaches those who need it. What we did is, okay, we created a PPP, and these are going as a fiduciary fund. They are going to manage the problem with the stakeholders. So the houses go to the community and they can see what is being built there and they receive all the elements and the community is engaged in building. In, in Panama, for example, we call the Habitat for Humanity because of course the Carter administration had a very good reputation after delivering the canal. But we also have self-construction with habitat. So we said, what can be better than inviting habitat to work in developing the new colon? And so we did. So there is a way to uh, coordinate uh, elements that are disrupted. For example, Arizona Sonoris now has been for 60 years a mega region called Arizona. The governors of uh, Arizona and Sonora got together to receive the Kaufman Award because the region increased their, uh, in spite of the famous wall, the, the region increased the, the level of trade and reduced the restrictions to trucks and jobs, in spite of all the restrictions. So at the state to state level, there is a lot of cooperation. So we also look for what we call mesoeconomics, the regional level where, you know, you don't have the federal government or the politics of uh, country politics is local politics, which is, okay, you know, I live in um, uh, El Paso and I live in Texas. So we have family, we have friends, we have shared businesses, logically we trade. So we, we look into that. It's a matter of taking a second look. As I always say, the first step in strategic planning is a step back. So you can look at the entire panorama. Absolutely. Same thing in higher education. Oh, <laughs> <So> I really, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, you know, Dr. Roll, I'm, I'm curious if you could speak uh, any, to anything about collaboration between uh, the, the people who participated on the book, whether or not, you know, uh, having the book uh, come out and wh whether or not people did end up collaborating, if you could speak about that. And having a thing with the mute and unmute. Um, originally, I thought uh, there were five or six of us who got together after a conference and said that we, we don't wanna stop working together. We wanna to continue to work together. And we did several publications uh, around this topic. This topic evolved because what we were looking at all of those scholars were looking at issues where education was supposed to be the answer, but many of our students were 
still having difficulty in the workplace and an employment market. In Chile, they were producing PhD scientists that had no jobs. And, you know, and, and, and they didn't want to leave Chile. They could go to Europe or they could go to the U.S. But um, my colleague from uh, Chile was saying that his students did not want to leave. And so we were trying to solve the problem. Just, as Mario said, how do you create jobs in economies where they're, they're not? Um, because we made a promise to our students that you do what we ask you to do at the undergraduate and graduate level, you will be prepared for work, but then where is the work? So when we came to, when we looked at all of we, what we were looking at, we were saying, well, is everyone else having this kind of experience? When, when you produce your graduates, let's say, let's just say in Timbuktu, uh, where's the market for them? And so that's, that was the genesis behind putting the call for chapters out. Uh, and, you know, I thought it, uh, uh, we were a group of six, I thought all six in the group would participate, but only two or three in the original group actually are published in this volume. I was surprised at all of the others that came together and said, this is a topic we need more uh, participation in. This is a topic, even practitioners were like, wow, I'm so glad that folks are at least allowing us to submit because, you know, a lot of academic uh, uh, venues don't allow practitioners to, 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 to voice. So, so what I found was, that there was an appetite you know, for more work, more collaboration, uh, more and collaboration in a loose sense, not just with the academics. You know, a lot of academics talk to themselves. Uh, so, so, but we had government folks, we had practitioners, we had academics all coming together saying, you know, it's not getting better out here. It's getting worse for some of our students. How can we give voice and empower not just the students, but ourselves to make a difference. And so that's how it came about. And it was, the second book was not even my idea. The second book was a publisher coming to me and saying, we like the start of the work, but the real issue is sustainability. Can, can, can you put out a call on sustainability of the future of work? As many uh, who are in the business of entrepreneurship know that starting a business is not the challenge is the sustainability of those businesses. Most of those businesses go out of business in two, three, four years all over the world. The issue is how do we keep them going longer so they could be the economic engines, better economic engines? Because if you know the data, small businesses are the economic engines around the world. Well, how can we keep them going longer? I know that was a long answer to your question, <laughs> but many have been working on this. And uh, you know, Ma Mariano is humbled. I mean, the work that they have done is voluminous and rarely can you find someone who's tracked their work over 9, 10, 15 years and still have something relative uh, relative and positive to say. So I so admire the work that they did. And I was grateful when he said, when I asked him, I said, can you? And he said, yes. And I said, Roger, he said, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, and that, that was my meeting in the beginning. It was Roger who said, Joanne, I think you need to meet Mariano. You guys are doing a similar work. Uh, and, and that was my introduction to some of the great work that they have been doing. So I'm humbled that, that he agreed to have the work in the book and that he did such a great job of highlighting, you can go into the slums, you can turn it around. It's not gonna happen overnight. Most of the politicians are looking for overnight revolution so that they can go on to the next, uh, the, the next whatever they do. But this work, as he proved, mm -hmm. is, is, is not overnight the work. It requires persistence. Um, it, it requires all the stakeholders coming to the table. I so enjoy when he talks about, he did talk about when him, and I don't know if he went with Roger, they went into the slum neighborhood and talked to the gang lords. Whoa, <laughs> like what a courageous re researcher. <laughs> but that's what we need. We need more courage. We need more innovation. We need to understand that if we continue to do what we've done in the past, we will have the old normal and that is not good for most of us. Okay, and GCNYC students are listening. <laughs> 
Gaston? I wonder if, if, if I might jump in because I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation here in the background and uh, you're kind of clearing the deck of the ideas that make you want to have a quick fix and impose and uh, the importance of recognizing all systems as organic functioning systems that you have to understand before you can uh, make any successful intervention. Um, I wonder if uh, I might ask you to kind of look, uh, give advice from the standpoint of being an entrepreneur in, in, a, in, in a challenging setting because uh, we're in a challenging setting everywhere. And, and that's the perspective that I'm focused on in, in the classroom in business strategy. Uh, you find yourself, you got to see what the what are the existing rules of the game? How can you change them? How do you get resources? How do you uh, create alliances? How do you listen? Who do you need to make part of the conversation? But I wonder if you might share some of the insights about uh, basically what the entrepreneurs that you've been working with can teach our students about being resourceful and effective uh, and recognizing the malleability of the institutional environment that political strategy and business strategy go together. Do you want to start, Mariano? Well, yes. I would say uh, the best uh, advice I remember from about uh, entrepreneurship is uh, Tom Watson, the, the founder of IBM, said everything starts with a client. And you have to look for the clients. You have to talk, engage. Uh, clients are on the ground. Once you have the idea of the client, once you are a client, you can see a lot of things that you can do better or differently or where you can have a niche to work. Don't forget that the reason why Apple is so user-friendly is because uh, Steve Jobs was a user, not a technician. The problem with a technical approach, the other side, the other side is if you start with a product, you are looking for clients for the product, and that's much harder. So uh, in, in places where subsistence is uh, a daily problem, you have a big advantage. That's why BOP, according to Prahalad, was a source of innovation. Because you, you don't have the, the luxury of saying, oh, I'm going to develop this incredible product in five years or three years, we are going to get a big market. People will learn to use it. No, you are there and you have to figure out, OK, how can I make a living uh, that is modern day today? And then they start looking at, OK, look at that. For example, I will give an example of one of the, uh, one, I was looking for one, one picture. Let me, let me use one second to, to look for a picture I had here about my, one of my sources of information. One of the sources I, I usually uh, consider more valuable. And uh, this was basically uh, going to the place where things happen and trying to find out, okay, uh, here, is, here is my source of, uh, of information. Let me, let me share this picture with you. Um, okay, here's my source of information, okay? He's explaining to me how to make, he has an idea. We are sitting on a cart. A car that is a tuk-tuk has a motorcycle behind. He uh, he likes to wield uh, uh, things, create like the body shop kind of. But the, the problem in this neighborhood is uh, streets are so narrow that a regular car that cannot pass. So they started, and that happens in all parts of Buenos Aires. So they started a little company building these cars for for motorcycles in order to make moves between one building or another around. So this is where you get ideas. If you walk the street and you look at these guys and try to find out what they are up to, yeah, you have to get there. You have to sit in the, in the street and see how this works, how they live. Here you have the cart. Hmm? And then you start building things for them as we did, this is Barrio 21, for example. But in Barrio 21, what I did was not just working with the guys in the construction, but this was a kind of housing we developed in the middle of a place that has a lot of, but we, I was working there with them. So this is the idea. You 
you learn with the soul of your shoes and your eyes better. So look for the clients and said, you know what, this can be a great idea. We started three restaurants, Peruvian restaurants that are selling food abroad. We try to use the, the app to help people in Buenos Aires to find out, you know what, you want to eat arepas. Okay, in Buenos Aires, let's come here. It's very close to downtown and it's very picturesque. So that's the idea. So my, my main point will be go where the client is and look at what is missing. Sorry, a long, long answer, but. Excellent, an excellent answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we, we are at time. I would like to know when we can expect the sequel to the book. Summer, summer 20, if we get on schedule, summer 20, uh, some, this summer, it should come out this summer. Okay, uh, very, very excited for that. Thank you both so much uh, for these excellent presentations. Really very inspirational to see what can be done. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Enjoy your day, everyone.